Ladies and gentlemen of the internet, my name is Demi God Schmerder here, hello and welcome back to another video and welcome back to another episode of Arrowverse Analysis. I feel like my Against the Current Tour shirt fit this week, considering what this episode did to this season. If you look across the Arrowverse's collection of shows, there's a common theme you'll notice across all of them. Each and every single show has a massively bloated cast. And believe it or not, that's a pretty big deal when you're making a TV show. DC has one of the largest collections of characters in all of fiction, and that's a double-edged sword when it comes to adapting that universe. And I'm a writer as well, so on the one hand, I completely get the draw of wanting to include a lot of those characters in your series. You're playing in a nearly limitless sandbox that just keeps expanding, so there's an inclination to indulge in that. But at the same time, I'm also a huge fan and member of the audience, and I recognize that more doesn't always mean better. DC's shows have always had this problem that Marvel never had, where they're trying to shove too many characters into too small of boxes. And sure, Arrow kind of gets away with it, because when you're watching a Green Arrow show, you also expect to see the Black Canary. But the more shows that the CW had under their umbrella, the more obvious this pattern became. As of Arrow Season 3, Arrow had a cast of seven different main characters that were in the know about Oliver's identity, if you count Malcolm, which I think you should. But again, that's only including characters that know about Oliver's identity. If you look back at Season 1, you had Oliver, Dig, Felicity, Moira, Thea, Roy, Laurel, Quentin, Tommy, Malcolm, Slade, Fires, and Shadow. That is 13 main characters in a single season. That is insane! And even though not all of them are in the know about Oliver's identity, they're all still important in some way. But Arrow got away with it because it had 23 episodes in their first season, and they knew who to introduce right away and who to build up later. The writers and producers knew what they were doing and knew that they could handle the load. But looking at the other Arrowverse shows, you can see that this is a consistent issue. Though, I am going to omit Legends of Tomorrow and Stargirl for now because I want to talk about them in greater detail. During Season 1 of The Flash, there were seven different main characters if you count Eddie. Considering a 23-episode season with Villains of the Week, that ended up working out pretty well and cemented The Flash as one of the greatest comic book shows ever made. Unfortunately, though, that couldn't last, as come Season 9, the problem with the cast reached a tipping point. Despite Season 9 having 13 episodes, which I think is pretty great for a cast of seven main characters, the season was split into two arcs and four filler episodes. And when you do that, you don't have one season of 13 episodes anymore. You have two seasons of four or five episodes. And when your number of characters exceeds the number of episodes in your season, that's a fucking problem! How are any of these characters supposed to have an arc anymore? Supergirl also had seven main characters during their first season, because yes, Cat Grant counts. I mean, in retrospect, it's a bit of a stretch to call Maxwell Lord a main character. But again, this worked because they had 20 episodes in their first season, which is more than enough time to develop their main cast, a few recurring characters, and still have time for a crossover. You look like the attractive yet non-threatening racially diverse cast of a CW show. Black Lightning had seven main characters during their first season if you count Bill Henderson, which I think you should. But while it only had 13 episodes to make that work, it substituted the Villain of the Week formula for a more plot-focused narrative which suited the show better. This new type of narrative allowed for all of the major characters to get their due amount of focus. Batwoman is a show I didn't like, but I will give credit where it's due. While it improved things by having a smaller main cast of only six characters, it was unfortunately blessed with a 23-episode season. Or at least that's what was planned, but it had to be cut down due to the beer bug. While I much prefer 23 episode seasons, I think that 13 would have suited Batwoman much better here, as they also used Black Lightning's more plot-focused narrative. Knowing they had a smaller cast, mixed with a narrative structure more suited for shorter seasons, it would have been hard for even a good team of writers to stretch that out for 23 episodes. Superman and Lois, meanwhile, has the exact opposite issue of Batwoman. 
at any given point during season one, there are 10 main characters, but only 15 episodes to explore them all. And what's surprising is that all of them have great arcs and get a good amount of focus throughout the season. It was a fantastic first season that came out at the height of the COVID pandemic. So it was fantastic to see a story just about family spending time together and overcoming hardships. But then we get to the poster children of bloated casts. Legends of Tomorrow and Stargirl. And I have very differing thoughts on how these shows handled their ensemble casts. Legends of Tomorrow was, and for the most part still is, the definitive way to handle an ensemble cast in a superhero show. Or at least the definitive way it's been handled in live action. You may not like what Legends did with all the characters on the Wave Rider, but it always gave each of them some kind of development. During Season 1, Legends had a main cast of 8 characters counting Vandal Savage. And that's if you count Jackson Stein as one because they fused to make Firestorm. But unlike other Arrowverse shows, Legends is smart about how it handles its cast and the crew constantly made improvements to the show based on audience feedback. Despite only having 16 episodes in their first season, every character got a proper amount of screen time and characterization, which is how an ensemble cast show is supposed to work. Stargirl, meanwhile, has the exact opposite problem that Legends has. Basically, if you're in this screenshot, you were a main character on the show at some point. Stargirl has 14 main characters during their second season, and that's only if you truncate the cast a little bit. You need to combine Jakeem and the Thunderbolt and Artemis and her parents together to achieve that number. And in all three of Stargirl's seasons, there hasn't been a single one exceeding 13 episodes. There is no way they were ever going to be able to give them all proper development and screen time. Though I should mention the context that that screenshot is from season 2, which I think many would agree is the weakest season of the show. Still has the best poster though. Season 2 had so much working against it, not just in terms of an insanely bloated cast, but also because the crew lost a lot in between the development of seasons 1 and 2. I'm of the belief that even though Jeff Johns planned to make 5 seasons, I don't think he ever expected to make more than 1. So he put his best foot forward and built a team of the best cast and crew he could to bring this very personal character for him to the small screen. From what I could tell, they had a near limitless budget and were able to put in way more hours into writing than any other live action DC show because they were originally meant to be a streaming series on DC Universe. But when they had to move to the CW, suddenly they had to make changes to fit within the bounds of network television, which included a massively reduced budget, a lot more limited working hours, and potentially even COVID restrictions based on the time the season aired relative to the rest of the DC shows on the network. Knowing that context, it's honestly surprising that season 2 is as good as it is. And for the record, it's terrible. The season is terrible. I'm not even going to pretend it's as good as seasons 1 and 3, because it's not. It's fucking not. It's an awful season. But again, the Stargirl crew took the criticism of season 2 to heart, and the result was that season 3 was a lot better. They did a lot of truncating of the cast, so there were really only two or three main characters, and everyone else went off in their own directions and became side characters instead of reprising that main character role they had before. Though an unfortunate victim of this was the title character Courtney Whitmore, and this fed into the other issue of the ensemble cast, the slow erosion of the title character's importance. Legends of Tomorrow got away with this, because it was always intended to be an ensemble cast show. Even as far in as Season 7, every major character got their time to shine and had distinctive characterizations and arcs that we got to see develop. You may not have liked those arcs, but they all had stories. They all had things to do. And the season felt very full. There was no character that was left out of any major developments. But this is another area where the other Arrowverse shows really struggled. Except for Arrow, which was able to keep Oliver as the main character despite cast shakeups, every single Arrowverse show with a title character eventually had that character played third, fourth, or even fifth fiddle to everyone else on the team. 
While on the surface, the Flash might seem like the perfect candidate for me to rant about here, he actually remained the main character for the entire first six seasons of his show. Sure, seasons four and five might be a bit of a stretch, but at least season five centered on Barry's daughter, which means Barry still mostly took center stage. Come season seven, though, Ralph Dibney got Omega cancelled, and I guess all the writers that disagreed with that decision left too, because Barry's been relegated to complete side character status. And while I personally appreciated the extra focus for Frost, since she's the best female character the Flash ever had, giving Allegra Garcia and this new character Kristen Kramer more spotlight than the title character was an odd choice considering the villains for the first half of the season. Mirror Bitch and the Speed Force were both villains that should have been really personal for Barry, since one kidnapped Iris, and the other commonly takes the appearance of his dead mother. And seasons 8 and 9 only doubled down on this, replacing Kramer with She Who Must Not Be Named. Supergirl fell into the same trap after four strong seasons with Kara zor as the figurehead, but come season 5, a season where the villain of the first half was Kara's once best friend, Lena Luthor, and somehow Nia Nall and Kelly Olsen are getting top billing. And while I think that Nia is a great character, and I'm glad that she got the extra attention, I can't help but notice that Kara was not the focus of the show anymore. I can't speak on Batwoman since I quit three episodes into season two, but Superman and Lois fell victim to this hard. Season 2 put very little focus on Clark or Lois in favor of developing this weird plotline about Sarah cheating on Jordan and then getting validated for it at every turn. And of course, this is also the season where the Cushing family drama famously took precedence over everything else in a season that had Bizarro. Yeah, Bizarro was in this season. Not that you'd know that if I didn't tell you, because Superman and Lois are barely in the season themselves! That was also the season that the show famously retconned itself out of the Arrowverse, but that's a topic for another video. But without question, the worst offender of this was Black Lightning. The first season had Jeff as the figurehead, or at least the combination of him and his daughter Anissa, and it ended up being one of the best seasons of superhero television ever set to air. There is a reason that this poster is on my wall. But once season two hit, Jeff's role in the season was immediately reduced in favor of the series ensemble cast. Some characters had staying power, like Jen and Khalil, and others became tiresome or lost what made them so great, like Lynn and Anissa. And sure, they redeemed themselves a little bit in Season 3, but that was also the season where the cast became incredibly bloated because they were adapting the outsiders to the small screen. So just having Jeff fight the main villain in the season finale was enough to keep fans engaged and get them back on board with the show. But man, nothing compares to Black Lightning Season 4. Without question, this is one of the biggest derailments of a once great show I have ever seen. And that's including the final season of The Flash. Hell, for my money, it's worse than The Flash, because at least Flash Season 9 had Oliver Queen in it. Jeff's presence in Black Lightning Season 4 was so small, and his role in the show had been so reduced that it genuinely would have been more narratively satisfying to see Khalil kill Tobias than for Jeff to do so. Let me repeat, the writers reduced the title character's role so much and wrote a side character so much better that it would have been more narratively satisfying to see the side character kill the man that killed Jeff's father than for Jeff to do it himself. Genuinely. How does that happen? And just for the record, the best episode of the entire show is in season four as well. And it's the painkiller backdoor pilot episode. The best episode of the whole show is the only episode that Jeff is not even in. Seriously, seriously, how did that happen? Yep, this, this, this shirt was definitely the right shirt to wear for this episode. Now, the reason that I go on this rant ahead of this episode is because this is the episode where it's the most relevant topic. 
as of this episode, everyone on Arrow is a superhero now. Maybe Laurel doesn't have the costume yet, but she's been training with Ted Grant for weeks. Ted Grant, who, remember, is Wildcat, aka another superhero. And here's the thing, I love superhero teams. I'm a big Avengers guy. I think the JSA is DC's best super team. I'm a huge fan of the Flash family. But none of that makes this not feel excessive. The Arrowverse has this bad habit of thinking that characters that aren't on the superhero team are irrelevant characters, and they should only introduce new characters if they intend for them to join the team or don a super suit at some point. And while some shows do it better than others, they all do this. Every single Arrowverse show eventually stops introducing civilian characters. And like I said, I get the desire to include as many DC characters as possible in your series, but there has to be a balance between superheroes and civilians in your universe, and the Arrowverse is notoriously not filled with civilians. The Flash, Black Lightning, Stargirl, and even Arrow have no relevant civilian characters left by the end of their final seasons, and that is a problem that I can only trace back to one thing. The fact that we live in the ensemble cast era. And don't get me wrong, ensemble casts can work, and they can work really well. The Boys, Arcane, and The Good Place are all examples of ensemble cast shows that utilize those ensemble casts to enhance their storytelling. But for some reason, every Arrowverse show falls into this trap of watering their series down by introducing too many characters to a cast that is already bursting at the seams. If this is your first episode and you're wondering how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below, along with a link to all my other episodes of Overanalysis. But I encourage that you watch this one first, I'm sure you'll still enjoy it. With that out of the way, let's return to the Overanalysis. Keto Shimizu and Eric Olsen returned to pen the episode Guilty, which first aired November 12, 2014, and was directed by Peter Leto, his only contribution to the series. After witnessing a massacre of a local gang, Oliver and company find evidence that leads them to believe Ted Grant was the culprit. During their investigation, they find evidence of Grant's past vigilantism, as well as learning he's training Laurel to fight against Oliver's wishes. What are you doing? Oh, that's new footage. That's new footage, too. Roy. Good cut into the episode, though. The Glavers get their weapons from the Bratva. The Bratva? Ooh, is that the first Bratva name drop we've had in a while? It's like somebody beat us here. Ooh. See, he left back to Paco. This was personal. What we did this was trying to send a message. I think I know what it is. Roll credits. I had to choose between the dun 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 and the roll credits, and I ended up doing neither of them that great. There are only 86,000 Pacos in Sterling. Damn, that's a lot. Something tells me the Calabra's long standing rivals will narrow that down for us. You know, when we find Paco, he'll be too dead to say anything. I'm not looking for him, I'm looking for whoever did this. Where is this guy? How's he gonna help us find out what this China White person is? Chien, no, China no. White! Hey, that's the first time they say China White! Waller hasn't been able to locate Chien that way because she avoids using any traceable forms of communication. Her courier who used a dead drop to leave behind information for Chien's network. Information will intercept. I see him. If Waller knows the method by which China White gets her information, and the face of China White's courier, how has she not already found China White? I know that this is a very minor part of the episode, but this is something that progresses the flashback so much, and it seems to only happen because the plot says so. Stay on Bluetooth. Did he say stay on Bluetooth? Ooh. Where is it? the envelope? You must have stashed it somewhere while you're chasing him. I didn't see him stash anything. Yes, you did. I'm looking for a calibre member named Paco. Paco's is street name. Who? Emilio Ortega. Pinging his cell's GPS. Why'd you kill all those men? Ted didn't do this. Ted's been with me for the past two hours. He trained with me, and then we went for dinner. I need you to test my blood for Mirakuru. That is 10 minutes of my life I am never getting back. What is going on? The reason I haven't been sleeping is because I've been having 
dreams. It was like I was remembering the time I was out, you know? Oh, Felicity knows what he's talking about. In those dreams, I killed Sarah. I actually remember throwing arrows into her. Oh, 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 holy shit, hang on, I never noticed that. There's a reason they show us this shot. Yep, there's Cupid. Why would a mass murderer string up a body in his gym? He thinks someone was trying to send him a message. Who? He says he doesn't know. I want to talk to him. About this case or me? Two weeks ago, I said I wouldn't train you to fight. Now you have a trainer. Who's training me to box, to let off some steam? Why are you sitting like that? I'm concentrating. Why? Because I need to remember something. Remember where the matching one is? See, your memory's fine. Hmm. Oliver actually has a surprisingly good rapport with Akio. He needs your help. I need him to remember what he saw when we captured Chiannawe. My debt is paid. All I care about is us getting home. Oh, come on, you must be cheating. I'm just better at this than you. <laughs> My son is off limits. Stay. Now, do exactly as I said. Ooh, clean transition. Yeah, I saw his title fight a few years back on pay-per-view. They called him Wildcat. Fighting in his gym was strung up the same way that the bodies in the warehouse were. Like punching bags. The Clavers were armed to the teeth, but the killer never fired a shot. They are beaten to death by brass knuckles. It matches one murder from six years ago, same as tonight. Clavers drug dealer. Blunt force trauma consistent with brass knuckles worn by a left-handed assailant. Ted Wildcat grants a lefty. Well, SCPD never put that together because Ted was never arrested. He's moving. You deemed him with a tracer? Just because Laurel trusts him doesn't mean I have to. Not a bad system, to be fair. Guess keeping it all in a storage locker is smart. So you're gonna see, right as Oliver does this swing, it cuts and he's not swinging anymore. And... There is the face of the stunt guy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the only time that the CW uses the boxing glove arrow. I'm being set up. Why should I believe you? Because I used to be a vigilante. I've never heard of another vigilante in Sterling. It was six years ago. I wasn't news. I stuck to the glades. This was hung around the body that was found in my gym. The key is to the storage locker. He's leaving me a trail to follow. Look, I've never killed anyone. Except for that drug dealer that you beat to death six years ago. I may have avoided jail, but I have lived with the guilt of that man's death every single day of my life. Who else knows about the locker? No one. This is where I kept my supplies, as I'm sure you got one just like it. Mine's bigger. Are we really going to measure the size of our... Our bunkers. Do you know that you're training with a vigilante? Former, apparently. And no, I didn't. So you also didn't know that six years ago he beat someone to death? How many more reasons am I going to have to give you before you stay away from this guy? What's the connection? The director was at the Sanzibar. The Sanzibar is where the drug dealer was murdered. You mean the person you beat to death? I told you. Whoever's doing this is leaving me a trail to follow. Then we follow it. We need another minute. How do you two know each other? We're used to date. <laughs> does he know what's driving you? I told him that Sarah's gone. Then does he know that you want to follow in her footsteps? Before we buried Sarah, I scanned her body using portable magnetic resonance imaging. It's not as good as a regular autopsy, but like when I can use it to determine things an autopsy would, like angle of attack, trajectory, and the force of the arrows. There are certain things about the forensics that I couldn't reconcile with. The angle and the velocity of the arrows were not consistent with a normal bow or archer of normal height. Archer of normal height. And the reason that I put emphasis on that line is because Thea, who killed Sarah, is very small. But if the arrows were thrown with mere cougar force, what if there was some residual mere cougar in your system? It would explain the forensics, the angle and the force of the arrows. If one last mere cougar episode burned down any remnants in your system. Episode. Which means it happened before. If you look closely here, you can see Cupid is actually walking away from the Zanzibar as Dig drives up. Believe it or not, I didn't actually notice that while watching the episode. I went to the Arrow Wiki, and I saw that she supposedly shows up here, and I'm like, wait, no, that that can't be right. Go to the episode. Yep, she's there. Someone's gone to a lot of trouble to frame you for murders and bring you here. Why? I see you got my message. Arrow, brass knuckles. I never knew why we couldn't just use a gun the way they did. Because we're better than they are. At least we're supposed to be. Shoot him in the shoulder! Shoot him in the leg! Do anything other than exclusively disarm him and give him time to escape by running up a flight of stairs towards where he would have been! You have options! Sorry you got past me. 
He knew an exit out of the building that wasn't on any of the blueprints that Felicity hooked up with. That's convenient. You had Ted Grant arrested? Your father's men found him at a crime scene. Another body was found at a storage locker that he owns, along with evidence of past vigilanteism. He's innocent. I know. I saw the person who's doing this. Oh. Not now. Do not do this now. I need to tell you something. This is not the time. I killed Sarah. Roy had no memory of the attack. Suppressed memories often resurface in dreams. Wait, Roy, where do you think you're going? Let him go. I can't process this right now. Focus on what you can process. Ted knows who we're coming after. I need you to find out who it is, okay? <sighs> okay. Hell yeah, compartmentalizing. You see in here for more than you think. You saw something, but your head is too busy. You need to quiet it. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Out through your mouth. In and out. You're floating in nothingness. All that exists is your breath. Any thoughts you have are cloud. They just drift away. I remember. Fun fact, this never comes up again. Who is the man behind the mask? His name's Isaac Stanza. I guess you can call him my apprentice. One night, we decided to go out to this drug dealer that was pushing crank near the school. Isaac got to him first. That murder from six years ago, that wasn't you. That was him. I hung it up after that. What about Sansar? Cut him loose. Oliver, this crusade of ours is supposed to be about justice. But if that's supposed to mean something, we can't have two sets of rules. I'm the one who brought Roy into this crusade. And maybe it's time for you to cut him loose. Oh, uh, now they're trying to draw the parallels between Oliver and Ted. Are you telling me to abandon him? Yes. That's what it takes to find justice for Sarah. Dig is really saying this? John motherfucking Diggle? Framing me didn't work. I'm almost afraid to think of what he might try to do next. What I should have done from the start. I'm sorry, I've been kind of a little bit out of it uh, while watching this episode. I'm probably gonna notice a lot more of it in editing, but I completely forgot to say that uh, Isaac Stansley here is played by Nathan Mitchell. He also plays Black Noir on The Boys. After you abandoned me, the Calabra found me. They tortured me for months before I escaped. You taught me that there are no innocents when you abandoned me to the Calabras. The call's coming from Laurel Cell. Moving fast, 45 miles an hour. They're in the car. All right, Oliver, time for one of those explosive fletchings that you showed up in The Hunter's Returns. Also, since when can Oliver's fletchings explode? Ooh. Wow. Is Oliver really gonna walk away from that? <laughs> I mean, he did walk away from this cave-in, so... You stupid! You're dumb, dude! Ooh! <laughs> that was such a dumb shot, dude. I actually like that they're having Roy fight Stansler, though. You're not a human being, man. You were just another weapon in his arsenal. And the second you do something wrong, he turn his back on you. And for the record, that's how Roy gets his name. Also, for the record, that is a stunt guy. Just put right there in front of the camera. Don't abandon me. The worst part about sobriety is having to pass on the pain meds. I never thought of that. You know, you're trying to protect me, Ollie, but I'm not helpless. I've never seen you that way. But Laurel, I'm always gonna watch out for you. Because I care about you. That guy? He said I was just another weapon in your arsenal. Maybe that's what we should call you then. Arsenal. Because it's a lot edgier than Red Arrow. I'm gonna be turning myself in. For a murder that the police don't even know about? Oh, this is why they have the memory stuff in this episode. I completely forgot that Felicity does not tell him. There's something you need to know, Roy. And I've been afraid that if I just came out and told you, it would only make the hurt worse. And focus on your breathing. In, in through your, your nose, nose out, out through your, your mouth. mouth. In. And out. out. Floating along. Weightless. The only thing that exists All that exists is, is your breath. breath. Now you thought you have a cloud. They just drift away. Police officer, why didn't you tell me? Because you were overdosed on Marukuru, you didn't remember, and I was hoping that you never would. But then Felicity told me you had the dream that you killed Sarah, and I realized it was a memory. Just reframed. So I didn't kill Sarah, but I am a murderer. Murder implies intent, and your mind was absent. This is the dead drop. 
kind of a message is this? Have you ever heard of steganography? It's the art of concealing a message within another message. Li Quan Hui. If Qian Na Wei is interested in him, so are we. Oh, is he the creator of the Alpha Omega virus? Good transition. Good transition. I want you. Pause. To give me the tools to avenge my sister's death. No idea why the cops are bringing Isaac out through this alley, but I do like that the alley that he dies in is the same one that he threatened to shoot Ted and Laurel in. Although, that might just be down to them needing to reuse sets to save on budget. We'll talk more about this next episode, but if you listen really closely, you can hear that Cupid's arrows have a different sound effect than Oliver's do. And as I pointed out earlier in the episode, this is Cupid, played by Amy Guminick. Who the hell are you? I'm Cupid. Stupid. I think my lizard brain activates any time I see Cupid. Well, that, uh, that was pretty messy. I think my lengthy rant of an intro was kind of justified there. This episode has one major problem, and that's the ensemble cast. There's just too many characters trying to do too many things here, and the episode is struggling to carry the weight of all of them and contain them to 42 minutes. Roy's having flashbacks to his Mirakuru episode in Season 2 that he misinterprets as him killing Sarah. Seems like it should be a huge revelation, but there's no time to dwell on that because we have to move on to the next thing. We're trying to introduce Wildcat to the small screen for the first time and building up his history in Starling, including seeing him taking up an apprentice that's since become vengeful. That's an interesting idea, but there's no time to dwell on that because we have to move on to the next thing. There's some parallels the episode tries to draw between Oliver and Roy and Ted and Isaac, which is a really great idea on paper, but that doesn't get explored any further because we just have to keep moving on to the next thing. This episode was just trying to do too damn much because it had too many ideas and too many characters to juggle. This episode should have happened later in the season, or maybe as the B-plot of the next episode, since that's an episode focusing on Oliver. It would have been a lot more interesting to have Laurel and Roy fighting a Stansler while Oliver took on his Psycho Stalker, and as a bonus, there would have been more build-up to both of those things happening. Unless you know who Ted Grant is in the comics, you're not going to understand the significance of him being a vigilante. We needed more build-up. Also, if Isaac really killed that drug dealer from six years ago, and they were beaten to death by a left-handed assailant, how come we only see him use his right hand when wielding a gun? I guess you could make the argument that he's ambidextrous, but the episode never establishes that, and I think with everything else that was going on in the episode, that detail just kind of slipped through the cracks. And why does Oliver exclusively disarm Isaac when he ambushes Oliver and Ted in the club? Oliver's been shown to shoot people in the shoulder or even the chest before in a non-lethal manner. So I'm not sure why this would be any different. Bringing up the possibility that a Mirakuru'd out Roy killed Sarah seems to only be included in this episode to remind the audience that Sarah's murder is still a thing the characters are trying to solve. This is the only purpose that this serves. And while I commend the writers for making Roy actually feel bad about killing a police officer even though he wasn't in control of his body at the time, this is the dumbest way that they could have done it. And of course, it struggles as a showcase of the ensemble cast. Because there are so many ideas floating around in this episode, nothing really gets fleshed out. Ensemble casts are hard to juggle, but because every superhero needs to have sidekicks, People think that they can just throw 12 plus characters into the cast and give them in-depth plot lines and see what sticks. But then again, none of that is really this episode's fault. It was poor planning on the part of the writers since there's still so much they have to do, and now they don't really have a lot of time to do it. This episode feels packed because it needed to feel packed. There's too much else going on in the season, that unfortunately, this episode just ended up getting bogged down. And unfortunately, unlike seasons 1 and 2, they only had 8 episodes they could use for build-up here because they had to fit in a crossover with The Flash. And none of that is even mentioning the plot of the flashbacks just being pretty sloppily put together this week as well. By all logic, Waller should have definitely already taken down China White's operations since she knows the face of China White's courier, 
and sent Oliver and Maceo to intercept the message she was getting delivered. But why would Waller do that when she can just not stop the message and follow the courier or whoever they hand it off to back to China White's bunker and then nuke it? If there was a bit less going on in this episode, maybe the writers would have ironed that plot point out. Also, the dialogue in this episode was really bad. A bunch of lines get repeated multiple times as if the writers are afraid that you're not going to understand what's happening. The writing of this episode is honestly pretty sophomoric, and it feels like this is the first or second draft of this script through the whole process. In an episode that stretched so thin with the amount of things that it has to do, it's no surprise that the characters aren't exactly written the best. Oliver flip-flops his characterization from scene to scene here. One scene he's trying his hardest to empathize with Roy, and the next he's trying his damnedest to put an arrow in Ted's leg. And you'd think that he'd know the message of guilty being near all the bodies would make this look personal and make Ted look less guilty. Sure, Ted was being uncooperative, but him going so hard on Ted here instead of acknowledging the possibility that he might be wrong makes him look stupid. All I'm saying is that the Oliver in this episode would definitely challenge the League of Assassins to a dick measuring contest like he did in The Magician. The story of Ted and Isaac gets some attention, sure, but the rest of the episode is too crowded for you to tell whether that characterization is good or not. And a lot of it is expository anyway, so we don't really get a lot of depth. Sure, the rapport between Oliver and Akio is nice, but you don't get to enjoy it because the flashbacks are honestly an afterthought at this point. The episode is too crowded for the flashbacks to really mean anything. Before the episode's last commercial break, Roy asks Oliver not to abandon him, and then two minutes of screen time later, he says he's turning himself in. And he's not the only character that flip-flops in that short of a time frame in this episode, either. I cannot believe John actually advocated for kicking Roy to the curb. And even if you wanted to argue that this is in character for him, which I'd argue it's not, he tried to stop Roy from leaving not 10 minutes earlier in the episode, which to me seems like he wanted him to stay. So either way, it's a character inconsistency. This episode just massively whiffs on the character front, and unfortunately it does so on visuals too, because I'm going to give it a lower score here. I liked seeing Cupid show up early since her spotlight episode follows this one, but you likely won't notice her until the end of the episode unless you know what you're looking for. And hell, I even missed her showing up one time and only found out due to the Arrowverse wiki. And while this is probably a note best served for the next episode, I like that Cupid's theme is a remix of the Arrow theme, similar to how Helena's theme was done in The Hunter's Returns. The boxing glove arrow was funny, but it's never even brought up again. The fight between Roy and Isaac is symbolically cool, but there was no build-up to it, so it kind of falls flat. Seeing Cupid ahead of her introductory episode is cool conceptually, but people have a lot of feelings about that character. There's some cool visuals in this episode, but they just kind of got the shaft at every turn for one reason or another. Be honest, who actually remembers that Arrow was the first time Wildcat was seen in live action? I mean, I guess he showed up in Smallville, but it was like a five second cameo, so does that really count? Honestly, giving this episode a two is generous. You know how I said The Magician was the Tremors of Season 3? Yeah, I think I spoke too soon. It's actually this episode. I remember liking this one a lot more the first time I watched it, but it doesn't really hold up all that well. Season 3 started off really strong, arguably stronger than the first two seasons, but these last three episodes have just kind of fallen into a slump, this episode especially. I was just kind of on autopilot throughout this watch because there just wasn't a whole lot for me to talk about. The next three episodes will be given full breakdowns all by themselves, since I feel they're all worthy of getting that full breakdown treatment on some level. I haven't exactly decided what I want to do yet for that three episode arc with Brick as the main villain. Maybe I want to have them all be one big breakdown as they all get full breakdowns, or maybe I just want to do one of the episodes as a full breakdown and give the other two quick reviews. But I guess we will find out when we get there. But I do know for sure that after that episode, we'll be transitioning to the back half of the season being mostly quick reviews without much of note that I wanted to bring attention to. There will be one or two off episodes where I feel like the episode deserves that special treatment, like the Suicide Squad, for instance. But you should expect mostly quick reviews once we finish the climb.
But anyway, that is it for this episode, guys. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to leave a like and a comment. That'd be greatly appreciated. Also, be sure to click that subscribe button if you haven't already so that you can join us as soon as friggin' possible. And while I'm plugging everything else, be sure to click the bell so that you get notified whenever we upload one of these crappy videos. But apart from that, I will see you guys in the next one. Peace out, guys. This is Demigod Schmerta. Edge!